I'm, I'm very excited about today. I want to tell everyone a little story about how all this started. So um, I'm, I'm fortunate that people come up to me and call me and, and email me with, with their crazy ideas. And uh, we were in, at Eagles in Dallas about four or five years ago. And, and this guy named Clay comes up to me and says, hey, Doc, you mind coming over here? And he takes me over to one of the tables. And he's like, I want to show you something. And of course, I gave him some tough love. And I said, I'm thinking to myself, th this guy is, you know, he's got a big vision, but uh, he's crazy because this is a space that many people have tried to uh, innovate in and have not been successful. So uh, we happened to uh, connect a few weeks ago and I, I got a preview of what you're about to see and I was totally blown away. And um, obviously we're all data people. And what I think you're going to love here is the the science, the physiology, the data, at least the early data. And the reason I have Dr. Scott Youngquist from Salt Lake City Fire is because he is, of course, because uh, he's always doing these types of things, collaborating with Clay on this product to, to get it into the first uh, clinical trial. So uh, Clay Nolan is a mechanical engineer who is just wicked smart. And um, he is going to just change the world. And uh, uh, Clay, I'm going to turn it over to you. We're, we're on record and take it away, my friend. Oh, man, you set expectations way too high. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so you know, quick quick background. I, I am an engineer, but I also um, worked as a paramedic for, for 10 years when I was studying engineering. And so I have, you know, kind of like a practical field experience, which uh, inspired um, the Ventor and Collapse Medical. Um, so uh, quick background, again, uh, I am the CEO of Collapse Medical. Um, we've been around now for about six, six plus years. Um, we've been supported by uh, Stryker yeah. Medical, uh, previously Physical Control, um, and then the American Heart Association, as well as Phillips Medical. Um, so we're, we're a well-funded company, um, and we have been developing this product for the last several years. I'm going to highlight the kind of the problem that we're solving. I know you guys are all experts um, in this space, um, but I just kind of want to hit on a few key points. So I'm sorry if it's redundant. Then I'll talk a little bit about our solution, the Ventor, and then our plan moving forward and open it for discussion. So I'm hoping the presentation will take about 15 minutes. Um, feel free, I'll kind of pause between each section and we can have, uh, I can fill in any questions um, as we go along. So this should be an interactive presentation and don't, don't feel, uh, you know, feel free to interrupt. So, you know, quickly going into the problem, and we're looking at um, emergency airways and ventilation during sp uh, CPR specifically. And so, as we all know, um, you know, actually what inspired uh, the Ventor was the American Heart Association's reprioritization of like the ABCs, right? And we've seen over the last 10 years that there's been, um, the primary focus has been high quality uh, chest compressions and the AHA has been de-emphasizing um, airway and breathing. And the reasons behind this, right, is that without good circulation, airway and ventilation are in vain. Um, and then that current ventilation techniques reduce blood flow by impeding venous return, right? So you have positive pressure-induced hypotension, and in the low-flow blood state of CPR, um, that can be have an impact. And one of the, you know, the biggest reasons is airway management, particularly intubation, distracts from other vital care. So if you look at the research, right, both in hospital and out of hospital, there's been a trend to placing supraglottic airways um, during the initial CPR, right? So if you look at this study, so I'm going to go back, um, this is a large, I don't want to say, I'm going to say it's like a 10,000, uh, excuse me, 86,000 uh, patient retro retrospective study. They look at survival rates at intubation in the ER within 15 minutes. And they're seeing that, you know, even in the controlled environment of the ER, um, that the distraction of intubation is actually decreasing survival. And so you move over to superglottic airways, right? And superglottic airways, excuse me, in the emergency setting or in the EMS setting, um, have shown an increase in survival, even though they themselves aren't perfect. Um, so there's been a trend in EMS that you guys are all aware of, of placing supraglottic airways initially, and then um, uh, focusing on high quality CPR, transporting the patient um, to the facility, right? And so those supraglottic airways, excuse me, um, are easy to place. They're not without pitfalls, right? And so one of the concerns is that the balloons or the positive pressure that current airways use to seal off the oropharyngeal um, it blocks um, blood flow to the brain, right? So they could be pressing on the cerebral, uh, excuse me, uh, excuse me, uh, carotid vessels, 
and therefore decreasing CPR, especially venous return from the brain. Um, and then supraglottic airways don't have the best seal. Um, they tend to leak at about six, 25 centimeters of water. And during CPR, um, you usually generate uh, ventilation pressures much higher than that. And so you're going to inflate the stomach, which could lead to aspiration, regurgitation, but also the positive pressure in the stomach also reduces blood flow. And then even in the OR setting, supraglottic airways um, are only uh, placed properly 70% of the time. Um, and that's, again, in the OR. So in the emergency setting, it's probably a lot higher that supraglottic airways aren't perfectly placed and tending to leak or tending not to actually ventilate the lungs. But this is one of the most interesting things, and this is one of Siegel's studies in Dr. Yiannopoulos' animal lab. And what he's looking at here, and the reason why I'm showing this slide is this is how we do a lot of our animal studies, um, but it also shows the impact of cerebral blood flow um, during CPR using supraglottic airways. So I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, but what they're doing is they're looking at uh, coronary, uh, excuse me, uh, cerebral blood flow um, through a Doppler, uh, a Doppler probe placed over the um, carotid vessels. And they're doing CPR for a total of 20 minutes, and they're switching back between endotracheal intubation and common supraglottic airways. And what you'll see is each uh, supraglottic airway uh, has a profound impact on um, blood flow to the brain. And so here you go, you got your endotracheal intubation, they put in the combi tube, and as soon as they inflate the cuff, uh, blood flow to the brain um, drops dramatically, right? So your carotid flow uh, drops to like, you know, 20% here. As soon as they pull it out and replace it with the endotracheal tube, you get a return of perfusion. And the same thing happens with the LMA, though it's not as profound. And the same thing happens with the King tube. And this is important, one, because we'll show you what our blood flow um, with our device looks like, but also this animal model um, is really important. Any questions, comments, gripes, or observations so far? I know I'm moving quickly. Your no, screen is, is not case. very yeah. clear. Is there any way of clearing it? Mm. Okay. I don't think so. I'm, I'm actually, sorry. Okay. I'm, at, I'm actually seeing it. Just, just try, try to make your screen as wide as possible and, and click on his name and say fit to screen. That's the recommendation. If that works. All right. That's so go ahead, click. Right there. Great. And I'm happy to share all these slides afterwards. Um, so I'll send them to Dr. Antevi and he can, he can forward it on if you want to look at the exact details. Mm. Mm. Thanks. Great. So, and then there's just the problem with current ventilation, right? Um, positive, pr uh, positive pressure ventilation reduces venous return because you have this positive pressure in your chest um, that's impeding um, blood return during CPR. And then in the emergency setting, specifically EMS, um, care providers are prone to sporadic or hyperventilation. Hyperventilation blows off too much CO2 and causes um, cerebral vasoconstriction, therefore decreasing blood flow. So even once you get an airway, um, the, the current ventilations uh, could be decreasing blood flow and it's done sporadically. Um, so uh, that's why the American Heart Association has started de-emphasizing it, right? And we all know that the current survival rates of CPR are pretty dismal. Um, they range between 10 and 20% depending on the setting and how uh, the facilities that they're being transported to. But does it have to be that way? And actually Dr. Youngquist um, shared with me a, a really interesting article looking at uh, arterial oxygenation um, during CPR in the hospital. And, and what I like about this is actually shows the importance of ventilation um, during CPR. So it's not one of these things where we can just neglect uh, ventilation during CPR. It's important to oxygenate these patients and balance their CO2. And I realized that oxygenation is, is based on both, arterial oxygenation is based both on ventilation and blood flow, right? So you just can't overventilate someone and increase their oxygenation because you have to have the blood flow with CPR to go along with it. But this article is still interesting and it ties directly into our data. So what they did is they took um, about 167 patients uh, who had arterial lines or arterial um, ABGs taken uh, during the first 15 minutes of CPR in hospital. And they categorized it into five groups based on the levels, you know, below 60 um, and then 60 to 92, 93 to 159, 160 to 300, and then 300 above. And then they looked at survival of these patients. So I'm going to have to zoom in on this real quick. Um, first, they looked at ROSC on these patients. And sorry, I'm going to go back to that last slide. And it shows you the number of patients in each group. So in the above 300, you have about 18 patients. Um, 
24 patients in the next group down, and then it's in the 40s for the rest. So it's a reasonable number of patients in each group. And then you look at the survival and ROSC of all these patients. And what you see here is that the patients with the arterial O2 above 300, 100% of them got ROSC. And then 55% of those patients walked out of the hospital um, uh, within 30 days. And then you can see a dramatic drop as the arterial oxygen decreases. So this goes to show you the importance of obviously both blood flow and oxygenation during CPR on their rates of survival and the return of ROSC. Any questions about the problem or the importance of ventilation and oxygenation during CPR before I kind of go into the solution? I'll just make one comment that it's great to hear a mechanical engineer talk about CPR and the and the the effects of ventilation on blood flow the right way. So thank you. <laughs> Continue. I'm, I'm glad I'm not making it up. Um, it's only taken me five years to figure it out. But uh, <laughs> all right. So so I'll talk about the Ventor. And with the Ventor, it's 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 a multi-tier approach to airway management and ventilation during CPR. And it literally is um, our approach has always been human factor or user centric. It's so easy to do that my, my daughter, when she was five year old, could effectively place our airway and operate the system um, with, without problems, with very limited uh, training. And you'll see that um, in some of the videos I'll show you, we've gone out and showed both uh, ER physicians, paramedics and EMTs, trained them on our device for a couple minutes and let them use it. And they're all able to use the product very simply. So even though what I discuss is, is kind of a complex in, its, uh, in its, its physiology and how it's working, the user um, is, is, is simplified, and I think that's one of the important things. So this is it, this is the Ventor. And what it is, it's an airway and ventilator uh, combination specifically to be used in the emergency setting during CPR. And it's got a disposable blind insertion airway here, which you can kind of see, it's, it's obviously the, the airway. And it's a dual air lumen airway without any balloons. And it can actually, and I'll show you in a bit, it can figure out where it is. Um, you, you blindly insert it, it can go in the esophagus, it can figure out where it is, it can go in the trachea, it can figure out where it is, and it ventilates accordingly. So works in the esophagus, works in the trachea, um, doesn't use any balloons to isolate the lungs from the stomach. And then um, it has a novel ventilation technique for increasing uh, blood flow during CPR, and I'll discuss that now. So the way the airway works is once you place the airway, you turn the ventilator on and you press start, or you put it in, in the CPR mode. And what it does, as I mentioned, it, it's a dual lumen airway. So you have one lumen that comes down and ends at the distal end, and then one uh, uh, lumen that ends uh, halfway up the tube facing um, anteriorly, kind of like what the old combi tube used to be, but doesn't have balloons. And when you turn the device on, it starts applying suction to the distal end. And that's the first thing it does. If it's in the esophagus, the esophagus obviously collapses because it's a soft membrane. The device um, detects that it's formed a perfect vacuum. It keeps suction applied around the esophagus, keeping it collapsed, and then begins ventilating out of the lumens that face anteriorly um, to the opening of the, of, of the trachea, right at the larynx. And then it constantly monitors, monitors that suction seal to make sure the esophagus is, is sealed. So that happens about 95% of the blind insertions. The other, you know, five out of 100 times, it'll end up in the trachea. And it does the same thing. It applies suction to the distal end. Um, if it uh, doesn't create a perfect vacuum, so the trachea being cartilage supported doesn't collapse, no perfect vacuum is created, it stops suctioning and ventilates directly out of the distal end. We have an algorithm that can detect clogs. So let's say, you know, the patient had um, uh, regurgitated um, before EMS arrived, EMS placed the airway, it went into the trachea, but it sucked up a bunch of chicken noodle soup beforehand. It can actually determine the difference between the esophagus and a clog, and it can clear the clog out and then continue to ventilate um, with our algorithm. Um, and then if it's in the trachea, it periodically reapplies vacuum pressure to make sure that it hasn't been repositioned. Let's say the patient's neck got hyperextended while moving, um, it can tell. So it's always monitoring its position. Any questions about how our airway um, figures out where it is and how it's operating? <clears throat> If that's chicken noodle soup, is it suck it out and get it out of the way? Yeah, absolutely. So um, let me go back to this. Um, so if you look here, um, we have a suction canister. 
um, that holds about 550 cc's of fluid that's separate from the um, ventilation lines. So it would suction up all of your contents and, and collect it in this canister. And it has enough to clear an airway out uh, two and a half times. Thank you. How long does it take to determine where it is? Yeah, and so it's initially um, initially figures out where it is in about three seconds, um, and then it takes a total of seven seconds to get a seal pressure good enough on the esophagus to prevent the ventilations from going into the stomach. So it's about a seven second evaluation period total initially, and then it would um, then it doesn't reevaluate when it's in the esophagus because it's constantly monitoring that pressure, and it doesn't do anything unless that that seal's broken. In the trachea it'll um, uh, suction for seven seconds on its initial evaluation, and then it'll reevaluate for about one and a half seconds after, uh, after ventilation. And, and so it doesn't interrupt ventilations when it quickly reevaluates. D does that make sense? And, and, it does. Is yeah. that yeah. and, uh, Sorry, is there a certain ahead, amount of that goes that, that it puts a limit on as far as the, on the tissue of the esophagus so that yeah. there's a, no necrosis or any kind of damage done to the tissue? Absolutely. So right now, um, what it does is it goes up to about 600 millimeters of mercury, which is a pretty strong vacuum. Um, we've been working uh, with Dr. Youngquest and Dr. Yiannopoulos in, in doing histologies on the esophagus. And what we've noticed is that the esophagus doesn't show any signs of trauma um, with our tip design and about 600 uh, millimeters of mercury uh, vacuum, as long as we periodically break that seal. And so about every you know three to four minutes, we'll release the pressure, then reapply it and we haven't seen any trauma associated with it. Um, in the trachea, um, it obviously limits the pressure um, to below uh, 200 millimeters of mercury. Um, and if it goes above that at any point, it'll notify the user. So you don't have to worry about like uh, decompressing the lung or anything like that. If it is in fact Angus. in the esophagus, if the distal tip is in the esophagus and you're therefore ventilating through the proximal holes, if there's secretions in addition in the trachea, uh, there's no way this thing can additionally suction that out. Is that correct? That is correct. It performs, it has the same performance as a king tube or eye gel at that point where you cannot suction out, you know, super glottically um, once it's in the esophagus. So it has the same limitations of a current super glottic airway um, when it's in that position. That being said, um, there is an additional suction mode. So let's say you walked up to a patient and they had regurgitated before you arrived. You can actually put it into a, a suction mode um, before you insert the airway. And then you can manually control the suction and clear out their airway and then insert this um, right afterwards. So you could, this would actually perform as your portable suction unit and you don't have to switch between um, suctioning and intubation or, or placing the airway. Mm -hmm. Uh, Clay, I see that there's a mask there. Does that mask have to form a perfect seal for this to work? No, great question. So let me get into the ventilation technique real quick, and, and, and that will help um, determine the purpose of the mask. So the mask is there just for orientation. Um, so, you know, you can insert the tube so the anterior, or the anterior facing holes are, are facing the right direction. And then also you can slide the mask to adjust for sizing. And I'll show you uh, a picture of how you use the mask to size, um, size it to the patient and then place it properly. So we kind of discussed the airway. So that's one of the novelties. The other novelty of our device is its ventilation technique. And what um, oh, this is kind of how the whole project started. I was like, what if you could actually use the positive pressure of a ventilation to enhance the chest and compression instead of impede it? And so the idea was synchronize these um, small volume uh, rapid ventilations with each chest compression on the downstroke. Um, and so you're literally compressing, uh, as the uh, user or care providers uh, compressing the chest, we give a ventilation to enhance the chest compression, push the blood out of the thoracic cavity. And then when the chest is recoiling, we actually stop the ventilation. Um, the air would get sucked into the alveoli and then venous uh, blood could return unimpeded. And so it's this rapid synchronization of ventilations, um, all done automatically and hands-free. Um, and the pressure would, we try to like achieve a peak pressure with each patient. So it automatically changes the flow to achieve the same uh, peak pressure in every patient. And we're like, okay, does that actually, um, can you actually get gas exchange with that and increase blood flow? And what we found out is that we can. Um, what's amazing is we actually, uh, this ventilation technique um, increases blood flow to the brain and heart. Um, we uh, greatly increase oxygenation of the blood. Um, it's, I think the idea is that when we're ventilation during the chest compression, it's almost like peep at the right time. Um, so we're uh, increasing alveoli recruitment, uh, but then we're not blowing off too much CO2 because the real gas exchange is happening 
um, during the recoil of the chest, and we're not um, hyperventilating these patients. And again, this is done all automatically. So Dr. Antebi, to your point, the mask doesn't have to be sealed at this point. It's an open system. It's almost like a, um, a jet ventilation that we're using the entrapment of the air with the ventilation um, to increase blood flow. So during all of our studies, we never have a seal on the mask. It's just there for orientation and to help with sizing. D does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. So during CPR, the mask doesn't do anything. Um, once they get ROSC, um, so we, you get return of pulses, right? This ventilation technique of synchronizing with chest compressions doesn't really do a lot of good when you're not doing chest compressions. And so going back to this picture, um, what you can do is switch to the second ventilation mode, which is the only other ventilation mode where you manually control the um, ventilation pressure by pressing that black button that's just above the mask. And what that does is once you press it, it starts a ventilation. Once you release it, it stops the ventilation and allows exhalation. At that point, you do need to have a decent seal on the mask um, to inflate the lungs completely. But it's not as nearly as difficult as ventilating someone with just a mask, right? Because the pressure is being generated down here at one of these lumens. And the resistance of the upper airway is actually helping you seal instead of hindering your seal. Um, did, I, did I say that clearly? Okay. So we've done uh, a lot of animal studies um, in several different labs. We're working really closely with Dr. Youngquist, who I'm so thankful is on the call. And then we're also working at Dr. Nautilus's lab. Um, we've done cadaver studies. Um, I think we're up to like 20 cadavers now working at placement, ease of placement, um, uh, algorithm for determining its location and um, ability to inflate the lungs. And then we've been working with fire departments on, on our mannequins and in cadavers um, just for human factors to making sure this device is easy to use. Um, you know, so going back to the ventilation technique, uh, give me one second, let me do this. Um, uh, you know, our idea is if can we increase the aortic pressure, um, can we basically widen these gaps, right? So we can increase both organ perfusion and during the diastolic, can we um, increase uh, perfusion to the heart? It, while getting gas exchange. And so this is one of our animal data. And we did the same um, study setup as I showed you early with the cerebral or um, excuse me, um, cerebral blood flow uh, on the pigs where we switch out between our ventilation technique and the gold standard of care every five minutes during CPR. And we're looking at um, uh, aortic blood flow. Um, and then we're also calculating um, coronary perfusion pressure and we look at ICP, and then we take blood gases at the end of each ventilation technique. So we'll do our device for five minutes. Um, we'll look at blood flow, and then right before we switch to endotracheal intubation with controlled ventilations per the AHA guidelines, we take an arterial blood gas. We do that for five minutes. We switch back and forth. And what you can see here is that we have a profound effect on aortic pressure, both systolic and diastolic. And what that means is we have, you know, we're increasing organ perfusion during the um, systolic, and then we're increasing um, coronary perfusion during the diastolic, as long as the right atrial pressure doesn't increase as well. We switch to intubation and everything drops. We switch back to ours and it goes up. We switch back to intubation and it drops. So um, pretty impressive for an all fully automated ventilation technique. Then we look at the calculated coronary perfusion pressure. This is the same animal. This mirrors the diastolic pressure of our animal. So we almost double the coronary perfusion pressure um, in this animal by just using our airway and our ventilation technique. So a lot of the times when you increase aortic pressure, um, you actually increase ICP as well. So this is one of the big things with automatic CPR, especially like the auto pulse. What they see is that you really increase ICP, which decreases or increases the resistance to uh, cerebral blood flow. And we do not appear to have the effect. I've never seen our product increase ICP on any animals compared to the gold standard of care. And this is what I think is the most exciting is the blood gases. So same animal. And these are their arterial blood gases um, after the five minutes of, of each uh, therapy. So we start off with a baseline. So this is before the animal is in rest, just to get an idea of, of what their carotid, excuse me, what their baseline blood gases look like. But also we have the Doppler carotid flow to look at what their um, uh, cerebral perfusion looks like um, in a normal state and then with our product. So you can see here after five minutes of ours, um, we greatly increased the PaO2 
Um, we balance the POCO2, which is important, and carotid flow obviously is, is a lot less than the baseline. But then when you switch to intubation, the arterial oxygenation drops. They're actually hyperventilating the patient, and the um, uh, cerebral blood flow decreases. We switch back to ours. We get almost double the blood flow to the brain. Uh, arterial oxygenation goes up to 531. So remember on the research paper I showed you earlier, any patient with a PaO2 above 300 had a 100% chance of ROSC and a 55% chance of survival. Then we switch back to the gold standard of care and everything drops again. So not only are we able to increase both uh, perfusion, we're actually able to increase oxygenation, which appears to have a direct effect on survival. Um, I've mentioned a couple of these things, but um, uh, it can function as a portable suction unit. So this is not an additional piece of equipment we have to carry on site. One airway sits, fits all adults. Um, it's adjustable. I'll show you a video of that. Uh, we have the second ventilation mode once they get ROSC, so where you can manually control the ventilations. Um, capnography sampling lines integrated into our device. We also have a viral filter integrated into our device. And then um, we have some other technology where actually you can see uh, the pressure uh, detection of the heart. I'll show you guys that next, but I'll stop here for a quick discussion. Yeah. Yeah, Clay, so we only have we only have two minutes and we're gonna jump over to the Eagles. You're more than welcome to stay for that. But I I, I wanted I wanted some feedback or some people to kind of try to poke holes in this, uh, because you got a great group of people here. So let's open it up. Um, first let's hear from Scott. So Scott, you're 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 taking a leap of faith with Clay. Um, what what are your thoughts on this? Well, um, I think we're still waiting for the FDA to give the, the thumbs up first for that. So it's not happening tomorrow or the next day, right? I mean, unless you have, if, unless I lost your email, it's going to take a little while to get this into the field. But um, this is a very interesting device because you not only get um, ventilation that matches perfusion, you actually get augmentation of perfusion. And CPR is great in the first five minutes of the resuscitation, but by minute 20, usually the wheels have come off and you're getting backup of blood on the right side of the heart. You're getting a very low PaO2, very high PaCO2. And we know this because we bring patients to the hospital for ECMO and draw blood gas and go, wow, they're either not getting good blood flow or they haven't got good ventilation or some combination of the two. And this is a device that seems to um, match those very well. I don't know if he, Clay just got very lucky or he, he figured out <laughs> some sort of quantum mechanical equation for this, but uh, it works very well and uh, much better than an endotracheal tube but keeping those two aligned. So um, I, I think it's very interesting, novel um, device for sure. Awesome, and Scott, thank you so much. And we look forward to having you present your research on this webinar in the future. I'm gonna hit you up for that, just FYI. Um, anybody else, I wanna hear Joe Holly. You, you've done all the, the, the cadaver studies on iGel and what are your thoughts on this, Joe? Yeah, Memphis. so uh, uh, thanks, Peter. Um, uh, I agree that you have captured the physiology very accurately. Uh, I think conceptually this thing ought to work. Um, I, I think it's going to come down to um, how well the, uh, what's the right word here, the process works. In other words, can, can, uh, can we be certain that the uh, suction on the uh, esophagus remains consistent so that we don't have an air leak there, uh, we don't get aspiration, all that sort of stuff. Provided everything functions as you have designed it, the enhancements to perfusion, et cetera, ought to be pretty impressive with this. So I, I think it's definitely on the on the right track. I'm eager to see how this works in the clinical setting. Awesome, great comments from Scott and Joe. Uh, we're at the top, we're at the bottom of the hour. I wish we could um, have more questions, but Clay, great presentation. Uh, I'm going to give you the last word and uh, take us away, and we'll head over to Eagles right after you're done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for your time. You know, as as uh, we meant, as Scott mentioned, we are preparing um, for a clinical trial. I'd love to share the details of kind of what we're looking at and get your guys' input on that as we go into study design. Um, Scott's been fantastic, but the more eyes uh, that we have on it. Uh, I greatly appreciate your input. So Dr. Antevi, I'll, I'll send you that information and hopefully have some offline discussions. But thank you guys for having us and uh, we will be in touch soon. <laughs> awesome. And ju just to reiterate, there's no, I have no conflict of interest. I just, I, I love this. And Clay, you're amazing. Keep up the great work. Keep working hard, my friend.
Okay. I guess let's do it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Drop off.